They done it! They done it! Darned if they ain't flu! Why We Saw, from Kitty Hawk to the Stars with Katie Coleman, astronaut, scientist, and musician. Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. I'm James G. Maynard. Today, we're talking about humanity's drive to reach new heights. No, 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 I mean, I mean this literally. From the earliest dreams of flight to the thrilling reality of space exploration and beyond, we're going to be taking a look at why we soar. Our special guest today is none other than former NASA astronaut Katie Coleman, who's going to share her experiences and insights with us on what it takes to reach for the stars, as well as the best within all of us. But first, let's take a journey through time. To see how our fascination with flight has taken us from Kitty Hawk to the International Space Station and beyond. Now, our story begins with the age old dream of flying like birds. You know, a large percentage of people even experience dreams of flying while they sleep. Now, we can trace this innate desire back to ancient myths like that of. Icarus, who famously flew too close to the sun. Are you certain these wings are going to work, Dad? Absolutely. Stop moving. The wax on your wings is cracking. But it wasn't until the 18th century that humans finally took to the skies, thanks to their invention of hot air balloons. Hey, there goes one now. I did most of the work. Shut up. No, you didn't. I did. In 1903, the Wright brothers made history with the first powered, controlled flight of an aircraft. Their success paved the way for an era of rapid innovation in aviation, leading to the development of faster and more maneuverable planes. Stunt flyers captivated audiences with their daring aerial acrobatics, pushing the boundaries of what was possible. Whoa! Oh, that was close. The 20th century saw the rise of jets and rocket planes, which enabled us to break the sand barrier and reach ever higher altitudes. But for many, the ultimate goal remained. To break free from terra firma, setting out to explore the cosmos. The launch of Sputnik 1 in 1957 kicked off the space race between the United States and the Soviet Union. In 1969, NASA's Apollo program achieved the seemingly impossible, landing humans on the moon. Now, each of these milestones, kilometer stones? inspired millions of people of all ages from around the world to fall in love with science. One of the most fascinating aspects of space exploration is a phenomenon known as the overview effect, a term coined by author and space philosopher Frank White. Uh, the overview effect refers to the cognitive shift that occurs when astronauts view Earth from space, gaining a new perspective on the planet and humanity's place in the universe. This powerful experience can lead to increased feelings of unity, 
interconnectedness and a renewed sense of responsibility for the planet. Newsflash, here is some out of this world news. Legendary space philosopher Frank White will be visiting the Cosmic Companion on the 3rd of August. We'll chat about everything from the overview effect to, well, tune in then. You'll see, it's going to be a wild ride, so don't forget to join us for this interstellar adventure. Today, the International Space Station serves as a testament to the continued spirit of exploration and cooperation that defines our journey into space. So far, around 670 people, including roughly 80 women, have journeyed into the final frontier. Astronauts like Katie Coleman have called the ISS home, conducting experiments and making new discoveries, expanding our understanding of the universe. Guess who we got up next? That's right, it's Katie Coleman, who's gonna come and's gonna join us to share her unique perspectives on space exploration, what it means to be an astronaut, as well as a human being as we all reach together for the final frontier. Join us for an interstellar joyride through the cosmos with the Cosmic Companion. Every week, our intrepid host, James G. Maynard, dives headfirst into the wildest corners of science, comedy, pop culture, and history. The Cosmic Companion takes you on a roller coaster of knowledge with entertaining dives into fascinating subjects. James is like your science-obsessed buddy who's always ready with a fun fact at a party. Oh, and what's a yeah. cosmic journey without some quality company? James rubs shoulders, figuratively of course, with the creme de la creme of the scientific world. We're talking brainiacs who decipher the laws of the universe, authors who craft stories that warp space and time, and developers who are building the future. Our cosmic guest list? Oh, it's star-studded. We've had the likes of Neil deGrasse Tyson, dinosaur expert Steve Brusati from Jurassic World, the legendary ocean explorer Sylvia Earle, a myriad of astronauts, actors, and a constellation of other awe-inspiring guests. But wait, there's more. The Cosmic Companion isn't just any show, we've got AI on our side. Hello, I am AI. Hmm, did you know that is a palindrome? We're talking mind-bending visuals, snazzy animations, original music, and soundscapes that'll make your eardrums do the moonwalk. Are you ready to embark on this epic journey? Head over to thecosmiccompanion.net and get ready to laugh, learn, and explore the mysteries of the universe. This week on the Cosmic Companion, we are absolutely thrilled to uh, welcome Katie Coleman to the show. She is a three-time astronaut who lived on, worked on board the International Space Station for six months. She had, she stars in the new film Space: The Longest Goodbye, and her new book Sharing Space just hit the just hit the bookshelves. Welcome to the show, Katie. I'm so glad to be here. Yeah. So you've done so much in your life, and your book just talks about all these amazing accomplishments that you've had. What drives you and inspires you to overcome these enormous challenges? Well, I, I look back and I think that maybe exploration and what it means to everybody, you know, to people, um, maybe has always driven me. Like whenever I discover something new, I always want to share it with people. And, and you know, be, I mean, I realized that like, you know, I left NASA, I retired from NASA in uh, the end of 2016. And, um, but I still, you know, the mission never really leaves. And, and I think what it gives you when you're there is this view of what, what needs to be done. So I'd say the, the list of what needs to be done in the universe is what, um, drives me. <laughs> That's a long list, isn't it? <laughs> it is pretty long. And and actually, you know, I think it's like, you know, you, some people, you know, for some things we should send a rover and that mean, means we need people who are going to design and build the rover and launch it. And for some things we'd better send some humans. And, and you know, I think um, sending people just up there to think and be themselves and have a different point of view than we've sent up before. Um, all those things are on the list. Mm, that's great. Um, now, 
I'm wondering, like, in addition to, you know, doing all these scientific accomplishments and such, you're also an accomplished flautist who uh, played the first ever concert between people in space and on Earth, jamming away with Jethro Tull. So how, how does music help inform and your your life and your studies? It's something, um, I don't know, my, my mom, like in sixth grade, or no, and the teacher in, in school just said, does anybody want to play an instrument next year? And I was like, I want to play the flute. Mm -hmm. And I think it's good, you know, with all the, the space thing that ended up happening that I didn't say the tuba or the cello, right? <laughs> but we have for cello. Uh, you know, actually, I, I kind of think I think like a cello player. I think that's sort of like waving, weaving through things. And so I play mostly improvisationally, but I, I mostly like playing with people and playing together. And when I was in high school, I got to we had a we're lucky enough to have a really big music program in Northern Virginia and, you know, a band director that made people think they could do things they weren't sure they could do. And I played in the stage band and learned how to solo. And I mean, jazz is still a, I would say a stretch, you know, I still mm -hmm. do, I do a little, I do, you know, kind of, you know, nothing re totally remarkable, but I just like to play and play with people. And, uh, and that's just kind of, it goes in phases. There'd be times where for years I didn't, I didn't play. Um, and then when I got to NASA, um, first of all, there were a couple of astronaut bands mm -hmm. and my favorite story actually from the interview is that, if you've done your homework, you know that they're going to ask you to tell you tell them about yourself starting with college. Mm -hmm. So I was like ready. And they said, "Tell us about yourself starting with high school." Mm -hmm. And I was like, "Um, well, um I I'm, I was in the band <laughs> <laughs> and I play and I play the flute and and Hoot Gibson looked at me, puts his pencil down, he looks at me and goes, "Do you think you could play the intro to Stairway to Heaven?" <laughs> and I said, Yes, he goes, good. And he writes it down. <laughs> and I think he just saw that I was nervous and he was just trying to make me feel at home, which it was completely successful. And, um, you know, so, but I hold him accountable <laughs> for my for my success. And actually, so there is these, you know, and I, and I just think, um, I think there's so, so many similarities between playing music and um, being, you know, and being in a band and being a, a space crew. Where, you know, you don't get to pick your bandmates really. I mean, maybe that first high school one, but you know, later on, you know, you need a, you know, a, this person and a, that person that plays those things, and you know, sometimes in people's families' life, you know, that won't work. Or, um, but we seldom get to pick our crews here on Earth either, mm -hmm. and we don't get to pick our space crews, and and they, it's mythical that they put a lot of like thought into, oh, this will work perfectly. And there's just a lot of constraints. And so, you know, when I see a band and living on the road together and, you know, it, when things are, they're hot and tired and this, you get there and the sound check people aren't good or the stage is different or, you know, it's just, it's like being in space where you make a plan and it's, you've got a really great plan, but it doesn't always work that way. And then you have to figure it out. So I, I think the relationships in bands and learning to do that, even in just improvising, can can be very parallel to space. Mm, wow. Wow. That is so intense. Um, so, you know, there's a famous, you know, space story from the early days of human space travel, though no one, you know, though no one's sure who to, to whom to attribute it, but... Uh, uh, either Glenn or Shepard was asked what his last thoughts were before liftoff. And he said he thought that this whole thing is built out of 150,000 parts, all submitted by the lowest bidder. <laughs> See, I have I have a different point of view about that. In that yeah. I mean, technically, they probably were, right? right, right. But, you know, I mean... I want to have my spacecraft built out of the by and built by the people who really wanted to build it, you right. know, yeah. and knew they'd have yeah. to have some skin in the game, and you know they had to meet the requirements and you know all those things. But you know when I think about how I feel when I'm going and people ask if you're scared and you know things like that, and I you know people if people have done their best, 
if they've really done the best they can do, you just can't ask anything more than that of them. And space right. travel is not going to be space if safe, right? right. But it's not for a long time. Not for a, well, not, not I mean for a while. Still, still a lot of a lot of fuel. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. But um, but I do think that you know that's all you can ask of your team really is that they're doing their best to to make the mission succeed. And and I do think we have a you know a little more assurance that we're probably going to come home than in the early days. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah so how do you overcome any moments of doubt or trepidation that that you might have um i think you have to figure out a way to do that because basically if you're worrying about whether you can do this or whether you you know, if you're worrying about anything except you're, you know, just doing the job, then that is distraction that you don't need and you can't afford. Mm. And so everybody, I think, has their own way to deal with that, whether that's just a great inner sense of confidence, um, which I wouldn't necessarily say is my way. I wish it was. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, um, but uh, you know, for me, it's knowing that I've done all the practicing that I need to do. Mm -hmm. And that means, um, you know, probably looking at my notes until the last minute and doing a bunch of getting up early and staying up late and kind of reviewing, you know, by myself, you know, what what I need to do. I, I The example I think about is actually um, capturing the supply ship up on the space station, mm -hmm. where it was the second time I'd ever done that. And the space station's like, I mean, right back of you. Um, you know, it's so it's like the size of a factory. And we're, we were used to on the space shuttle, you know, if my, if here's a space shuttle and then there's a, something that's going to grab with a robotic arm, they're kind of similar sized and either one can run away if needed. But um, this is like a truck full, pulling up to the factory and the factory can't move away. So things have to be done really, really well. And, and this was the early days of doing that. And, and, pra and supply ships were the practice for what you're seeing today, mm -hmm. which is people inside those ships. And so it took, you know, took, you know, practicing like that. So for me, it's just knowing that I've done all that practicing um, and that I really am ready. It helps me just put all that stuff aside and then just be, you know, engaged. Hmm. Um, and so what are your, what are your biggest hopes for how space travel can, in space habitations can help change society? Uh, in the future, hopefully for the better. Hopefully for the better. You know, that <laughs> that's a good, I mean, it's certainly a good question. Um, you know, on the, on the hopeful side, it's totally not fair, but there's something compelling about space. And if somebody says, you know, we need a better this, we need a better microphone or earphone or computer for space. I mean, people want to be part of that effort and they want to make it happen because that's important. And it, and and, and I, th I do think exploring space is really important. And I think when accidents happen, whether it is, you know, a, a spaceship that explodes, with no people inside, but just, you know, something very precious that took a long time to you know, to get it going there, um, or let alone people. I think the reason that so many people want to tell me where they were when Challenger or Columbia happened is because it going to space represents this idea that there's just, there's always something else that we can be looking toward and going toward that will be become part of us. And, and I think it's losing that hope, you know, realizing that hope might be finite, might not be as much hope as we thought. Um, is what upsets people. So I that's a long way to say that um, uh, we can trade on that knowledge. And, to, and so the fact that space is compelling. I mean, people will listen to me, they will answer my emails, and it's because of what I used to do, right? And right. so I think a lot of us feel like we should use that power and that platform for the power of good. Mm. And so I'm hoping... And, and I already see this certainly happening. I mean, the research that we do up on the space station... We're, we're doing stuff that we can't do down here. And it opens up answers and new questions that we wouldn't have had unless we were doing this in this new laboratory with, you know, a, you know, very little gravity. And, and I, and, and people, you know, I, I think just, <laughs> I'd say I can always say that within the past two days, I've had to tell somebody why it's important to spend money on space and not on earth. And 
first I tell them that all the dollars are spent down here because we haven't found anybody new. We haven't met anybody new to give those dollars to, right, <laughs> out in space. But um, but more than that, that so many discoveries down here that are meaningful, making you know new new kinds of um, controlled release drugs. You know, are are so, you know some of the knowledge is based on doing experiments in space without gravity, where you can figure out really what does that encapsulation need to look like to be more perfect. And mm -hmm. and so um, there's you know discoveries that we make about liquids, about combustion, um, and you know so many different growing plants is a great example. I mean, we'll have food for the way to Mars, but we're also going to be able to grow things down here on Earth. And and that makes me. I mean, I am an optimist, but um, I think it's I think it's important that we make sure these benefits are benefiting not just six people in a spaceship. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you know, we talked a little bit before this interview about um, space philosopher Frank White, who's best known for coining the term the overview effect. Um, can you talk a little bit about what what it was like to see space to see Earth from space for the first time and how's that the very the, the very first I'll, I'll tell you my very first view of massachusetts i mean first of all just the first time just going up on this mission my sts 73 laboratory mission five rookies and two experienced people seven delays over 30 days so there's a part of you that really just thinks this was never going to happen. They were just kidding. And so when it really does, and you really do lift off the bat, <laughs> we were so excited. We were like, there was, there, were, there was some hooting and hollering, right? And the commander goes, settle down. <laughs> um, it was a little embarrassing to tell, but um, but it's just so, it was amazing to be up there. And yet then you're, you know, you're up, you know, get up it's you know eight and a half minutes and right. you know now the the external tank is going to come off and you have to pull out that camera on a lens put it together take really good pictures and and even though you could look out the windows they're in back of you because you're working and it's not until we actually opened up the payload bay doors and you kind of have this like view out that window and this window and you see the earth and it i was like wow you know i am in a spaceship orbiting the earth and it's just such a special place to be but I would say the most surprising thing to me, getting to see that, you know, every day out the window of the space station is that I didn't, I thought when I went to space, I'd go someplace different, but I, I felt like I was still from earth, just a little further away than everybody else. And really excited about being one of the six people to get to sort of, you know, be the people at the edge exploring for everybody. Um, but I didn't, I, I just made me realize that home is just bigger than you think. Hmm. Hmm. That's beautiful. I love that. Um, so how do we encourage science and learning and education in today's society, which is just so full of disinformation? Um, not by doing the same thing, you know, that we've been doing. I mean, if you look at the way science is taught in different places and I don't know. I, I mean, I'm a smart person in some ways and in other ways, you know, it's, I mean, like I tell people I'm in chemistry, chemistry kind of makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. I think about molecules and I sort of see them on the dance floor and I know why mm -hmm. this one might be with this one or yeah. I'm a polymer chemist, so long chains of molecules and which ones might string together more easily. Mm -hmm. But when you start talking about physics, that's not intuitive to me. And yet I do need mm -hmm. to understand it. And it just means that I need to ask for more explanations. And I love, you know, these things on YouTube where it's, I mean, um, smarter every day or I mean, veritasium. I mean, all these ones where somebody who's thought about how can I explain this to people is trying to share what they've figured out. And I learn better from somebody telling stories than I do from just assimilating in the book. And it's because, you know, we all speak differently. And it took me a while in college to realize, like, I'd be reading physical chemistry, which almost, like, was... <laughs> I survived P-chem. <laughs> you know, it was, <laughs> was not my favorite thing. And uh, and I'd be reading along and they go, this happens and this happens. And then, and then this is why this happens. And there'd be an equation. I'm like, okay, equation, next. But that equation is a sentence to somebody. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But if you could make 
you know, if you could make that make sense in a story or why it was important, if you, I mean, I think that that's actually half the battle is explaining to people why it's important. And I think you have to tell them stories that mean something to them about why, you know, I mean, not everybody's going to be a scientist, but I know how I feel when something's happened, something's, you know, medically wrong with somebody that I love. And I, you know, I want to understand what's best for them and where to get the best advice and what to believe and what not. And I think you need, you need to have, you know, to know that you've learned some science or, you know, where to go read about it. Right. And finally, what, if you could give one message to up and coming early career scientists or even people who feel down and out about trying to make a difference in the world. What, what piece of advice would you give them? Um, I tell them to watch your show, right? Oh, thanks. Oh, but... No, but seriously, I, I think a different... Um, I, I tell them that there's a lot of perspectives to have and, and perspectives that are going to be valuable to them. And if they're always looking in one place and trying to go on a path that's straight, mm -hmm. it's it's just a myth that all any of us arrive someplace from some straight path. And it's often the things that you kind of take a little time to sit on a bench, talk to somebody new, learn something new that you kind of put, it's put, it puts what you want or what you think you want in perspective. And so I, I think the more people you interact with in whatever way is your way, some people it might be going to the theater and watching and some people it might be getting to talk to those people or hang out someplace where you know you're going to meet creative people um, or or you're going to meet, you know, nerdy math people, great nerdy math people, you know. So, but whatever way it is, I say, um, you know, reach out to people and especially reach out to people that you might think, well, but they already know everything and, you know, why would they want to talk to me? So many of them either would love to talk to you, people who are already accomplished in their field, or if they don't, that's actually just too bad because you are the new generation and you need to tug on the sleeves that you need to tug on in order to get what the perspectives that you need to go where you're supposed to go. And so realize that, you know, you're sort of doing this for the world. Go tug on those sleeves. Excellent. Well, thanks so much for being on the show, Katie. It was fabulous talking with you. It was really nice to talk to you, too. And um, can I show you who else oh. was... Well, oh, pretending please. to listen. It's going to look right. like one big blob, okay? All but... right, one big furry blob. Oh, 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 what a sweetheart. Oh, oh. He's like, is my mom talking again? <laughs> 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 and I am a long talker, so I hope that uh, I didn't, I gave you enough room to ask what she needed. Absolutely. So I'm just curious, did, did the cats, uh, Saber and Max, like, seem to have any recognition of you on video when you're talking from the ISS? Um, hey, Max. Um, well, Saber and Max were not around. Oh, but right. we did, oh, but we course, did. That was a while ago. Right. But right. we did have, we did have, we did have Fang who looks very oh, much right. like Saber mm -hmm. and they're related. And, um, and actually in the longest goodbye, that was Fang. Oh, all right, and, all right. and Issa, you'll see my kid, you know, bringing the cat up to the camera. And, yeah, and somehow, yeah. you know, we have a talent. Oh, here's Max. Hello, Max. Oh. <laughs> this is Max. Max is three years old. They're both Maine Coons. And, you know, and I, I actually wanted to make sure, you know, when I was going to be away that um, we had actually uh, lost a kitty. And I wanted to make sure that um, our kid had somebody that would sit with him, you know, when his, when his, uh, when his mom was gone. And and these Maine Coons are the closest you can get to a, a dog and still be a cat. So it meant a lot to me to have them around with them. And um, I I had a, just stray cats, but they, they were actually resemble these ones. And um, one of them that was still around actually stayed with my vet, mm, who was wow. very kind. And what it's, he became one of those cats that sits on the counters and greets you and things like that. Mm -hmm. And you get to have mm -hmm. conferences when you're up on the space station. You get to have three with whatever groups you want. And so I met with my Houston friends, but that included my veterinarian and everybody that worked in the clinic. And so they brought <laughs> they brought Marco <laughs> to mission control. <laughs> And Marco got to be seen on the big screen and he got to be in space and <laughs> it was awesome. That's great. 
Uh, again, thanks so much for being on the show, Katie. Fabulous Thank talking you. with you. And that was uh, Katie Coleman, three-time astronaut and st stars in Space, The Longest Goodbye. Check out her new book, Sharing Space, now out wherever you get your cool science books. Go check it out. Thank you. So nice yeah. to be with you. Looking ahead, the possibilities for space exploration are truly endless. From exploring other worlds to harnessing the resources of space for the benefit of humanity, the next chapter in our quest for the stars is sure to be filled with excitement and discovery. But reaching these goals will require continued innovation and investment in space technology as well as a commitment to fostering international cooperation in space exploration. As we come to the end of our journey, we see the human desire to soar is stronger than ever. From the earliest dreams of flight to the daring missions of today's astronauts and tomorrow's explorers, we as a human race continue to push the boundaries of what is possible as we reach for new horizons. Hello? Did someone call for new horizons? Here I am. Hello? Anybody? I'd like to thank Katie Coleman for joining us today and we hope you've enjoyed this episode of The Cosmic Companion. Be sure to subscribe, follow, share, and you'll get all sorts of fascinating stories from the world of exploration. Just fascinating. That's from us. Oh, yeah. Until next time, clear skies. <laughs>